My name's Mark Pritchard. Um, the gentleman to my right obviously needs no introduction. Hello. Uh, <laughs> um, and I have, the, I have the pleasure and the privilege of uh, working with Kosuke at Cloud Bees. Um, for those of you who don't know that obviously when, when he's not busy uh, working with the Jenkins community, Kosuke has a kind of side job at, at Cloud Bees. Um, this slide is, is the important one, if you like, so I thought I'll put it up at the beginning. We'll talk about all the things that are included here, and then so we, you'll see this one again at the end. But uh, this is really what it's all about for this session. What we'd like to talk about is just to introduce to you some of the things that we do at, at CloudBees to contribute in our way to the, to the Jenkins community. So I'll be talking uh, about an, a number of plugins. Many of them are available free as part of the, the CloudBees free enterprise plugins package. There are others that uh, we uh, make part of our Jenkins enterprise package, for which, you, which is a subscription-based offering. So we'll talk about uh, you know, a few of these, some of the, the most interesting ones. And Nicholas, who's down here, he has, has done an excellent wiki post on these for more detail, and you can just get these from, from the Upgrade Center. So, you know, we, we want you to encourage you to pick these up, try them out, let us know how, the, how you'd like to see them extended, what we should be doing with these, where we should be going, and so on. So, uh, what we're really trying to do, I mean, to me, I, I'm somebody who, I should say, by the way, my background is I worked for many years in the Java space. I was at BEA Systems uh, for about 10 years. I then became part of Oracle, um, was using Jenkins for quite a long time, but uh, really only since joining CloudBees have I you know, become aware of and be tried to become part of the, the Jenkins community. And it's always seemed to me that one of the key themes with Jenkins is just to make it easier to do the right thing than to do the wrong thing, which is really the only way of making sure that the right things happen more and more. And what we're really trying to do with the plugins that we've been contributing to the, to the community is really to try and get rid of, you know, wasted time, lost time due to the kind of silly things that can happen. You're, everyone's busy doing their jobs, everyone's busy trying to make things better, but sometimes things get overlooked. And you know, just for, for lack of the right tools or because it's a little bit harder to do things in the right way, you get problems coming up, you get downtime, you get sort of misunderstandings, and we're just trying to improve that efficiency for the people that, you know, people like yourselves who are the, the champions and the kind of people who are trying to teach everyone else how to do it the right way. And so the, the way to do that is to rely on Jenkins and, as they say, to to build in the tools and the plugins to enable you to manage things in the best possible way. So a lot of this stuff will probably be things you know, that you're, you're, you're doing anyway, you're trying to do anyway. We're just trying to make it easier for you to do it and kind of make it so that it's just muscle memory and you don't even have to think about it. But we're looking at, at you know, better ways in which you can organize those jobs, in which you can ensure that teams are actually using the tools in the right way, uh, make it easier for, for people who really aren't, you know, they're developers, but or they're leading project teams, QA folks, but they don't perhaps know Jenkins, they don't understand the whole continuous integration picture. We want to make it easier for them to, to pick things up. We want to make sure that you don't have lost time, you know, trying to recover from errors, that you have better availability, that we can you know, recover from failures faster and so on. So with that very quick overview, what I want to do is to get in and talk about some of the specific things we're doing and then Kosuke is going to give a series of demonstrations so you can actually see all these things kind of hands-on as we go through. So we're going to be doing a, a bit of a double act from now on and obviously Kosuke will, will jump in and add any detail on any of these. Uh, as we go through. So one of the first ones is, is kind of simple, but you know, if you, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with this at some point, your kind of first effort you go through and you build all the different jobs 
And actually, it's very easy to end up with just a huge list of these things that kind of scroll off the bottom and, you know, how are you going to organize them? And you, you start creating views and then you get more views and, you know, maybe the taxonomy isn't right initially and so on. And you just need a better model for how to do that. So one of the first things that we can do here is actually to create this concept of folders, just like you have, you know, with the operating system on whatever computers you're using to develop. These can be namespace aware. Within the folders, you can have views. But you can actually organize things in a way that fits, you know, your development organization, for example. This will map much more naturally then to the kind of organizational structure you have. And that means that it's easier for you, it's easier for people that are using the system to come in and find the things that they need and not get tangled up, frankly, in the things that they don't need and don't need to look at. This one, it's part of the free enterprise plugin set that I encourage you to look at and download. And you know, we'll come back to that uh, slide again at the end. So, Kosuke, over to you. Yeah, so you know, as Mark was saying, it's kind of common for people to see creating so many views to the point that like, it falls off from the right, which is not ideal. So um, for folders, uh, folders you can create like you create jobs. So let's say, uh, let me create like a folder for some theme. And you just choose the folder and then create new job, essentially. <laughs> And once it gets created, it kind of looks and feels like the top page of its own. And here, you can but notice in the breadcrumb that it's actually running inside the top. You know, it's a, it's a, a created a new folder. So here, inside this folder, I can create uh, any number of jobs, like I normally do on the top page. Um, and uh, let me just create like a few more. Um, and the new, maybe a QA job. And the thing is, I mean, these folders create their own namespace. So if the folder wants to be built after the CI job, they, you, know, you can set up that kind of relationships. And so in a, in a way, it's a closed, contained Jenkins subsystem of its own, I mean, sub-environment of its own. So it's very handy if you've got multiple teams that you need to uh, that, that need to share the same instance by splitting them. And you can, for example, copy around the folders. So um, if I wanted to like, uh, copy this to another team, um, or the, the common, another common pattern is, um, actually, let me scroll this up a little. Another common pattern we see is if you create like a series of jobs for a branch, right, that's interrelated, and you can copy the entire thing and then you sort of instantly replicated the whole thing with the relationships intact. Um, you, know, you can define the, the properties in the folder so that the jobs inside it could look at those property values and so that would provide you like a one place to change all the re related information. So that's basically what I wanted to show in this part. Um, so the, the next uh, thing that you know, we'd like to look at is, you know, we can create all these folders, we can organize the jobs in a certain way, but we want to look at who can access them, who's allowed to access them to do what, how can we map, you know, people's roles to, to their access permissions and so on. And clearly, this brings us, there is a whole topic here around security. I'm sure there are going to be other people speaking here today uh, about the, the whole issue of, of securing uh, access to Jenkins and Kosuke talked earlier on in his keynote about you know the the advisories and and so on. Now clearly there's there's a lot more to this than, than I'm talking about here. This one plugin is not going to address all your security needs in terms of of securing a Jenkins installation. There are going to be the things you need to do in terms of you know the the, the patching that you need to do to ha make sure your your OS is secure, your firewalling and so on. We can't talk about that here. And similarly, in terms of um, setting up authentication and how you link that to the various security realms and technologies that are used with, within your organization. So obviously, don't forget about those. I'm sure you're all well aware of them, but yeah. that's not well, what we're really talking yeah. today. For know? those, uh, I think we've done a webinar before and that mm -hmm. you can see the record and on the wiki.jenkinsci.org there's a number of articles about things you can check. 
Excellent, thanks. And, um, you know, again, in terms of authorization, here's just a, a, a brief summary of the kind of the starting point. You know, so we, there is this core extension point for authorization that's kind of responsible for uh, deciding who is authorized to do what within Jenkins. You know, the key thing is the default is for a clean install, it's going to come in unsecured. Okay, so what we're looking at is how can you take that and build on it? Obviously, you know, I'm sure there are people in the room who have already done this yourselves in specific ways. What we're looking at with uh, the, uh, the next one of our plugins is, is the CloudBees role based authentication plugin, uh, sorry, role based authorization plugin, I think that should be, uh, which provides a set of, of features out of the box that's going to let you basically map access to different jobs based on membership of particular projects, particular groups, and to, to, to decide who can do what based on their role in the organization. So it's the idea is to let people do what they need to do for their job and their role in the organization, no more and no less. So should we have a, yes. let's have a look at that because it's probably easier to see it than for me to waffle about it. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so, um, the, um, so in, in our, so the role-based access control plugin is the sort of takes over the authorization part, which is controls what, who can do what in Jenkins. And so you still have to connect this with authentication part, which is basically, you know, what identity database you talk to, be it Active Directory or LDAP and whatnot. Um, so one of the things you can do with RVAC is um, that, it, that you can create groups and then you can put people or the groups that define in the external identity database in it. And then, um, then you could assign this um, group a set of roles, which is like a group of permissions. So that we, you know, in this demo, I have this developer role that has a bunch of permissions that's deemed necessary for our developers. And then there are a separate set of roles um, available for, let's say, the administrator, which has like an entire control of the system and so on. And um, so what I'm going to do here is, let's say, hypothetically, we wanted to um, create like a Skunkworks project that's a top secret project within the company. Um, so what we can do is we can create the uh, folder for the Skunkworks project because you know the, this single project will probably need a large number of jobs, you know, be it the CI build or test execution and whatnot. So um, so I just created a folder, uh, but right now it's visible for everyone. So actually, let me open like a secret. Uh, so this is an um, uh, incognito mode, so that, so that I can show you two. I, so pay attention to like a user that I'm logged in as well. I guess I can't see it here. Uh, it's now logged in as Alice, and right now you can see the Skunkworks projects because this is you know, just newly created. So now I'm back as administrator of this system, and what I can do is, in this folder, I could uh, tweak the configuration so that only people who have explicitly assigned a role could do stuff. So first, I could say, well, you know, in this folder, normally the permissions that you get in the parent is kind of trickle through all the children's and descendants, but right here we I'd say um, in this Skunkworks folder, we don't want that. We, we kind of want this to be hidden from everyone else. So we require that the people explicitly have this permission on this folder. And because I said that, if I reload the page as Alice, then you see that the Skunkworks project has disappeared. So she won't notice that there's such a thing as the Skunkworks project. Now, the but you know, to add some more people, now I'm back as administrator, and then I'm gonna create a new group that says, um, a, uh, I don't know, this kind of works developers, I guess that's what I want to do. And then in this group, um, let's say in this folder and, the, and downward, this guy, this group has permission to do everything. Yeah, and then I'll add a few more people in it. So let's Alice, let's add Alice into this group so that she can now, and then if I go back to Alice, the brother of Alice, she'll see the Skunkworks again. And not only that, she can now start editing this role. So I can add the, um, sorry, the Alice can add more people to this group. For example, she can add Bob to the mix, and then so on. So um, 
it allows the, the administrator of Jenkins instance to delegate subsections of Jenkins to different people, and then within those scopes, these guys can add whatever people they need, or they can create local groups that fit their needs. So it allows you to delegate the access control settings to different people, individual teams, and let them take control of whatever they do. So um, I think that's basically what I wanted to show in this demo. That's great, thanks. So another thing that we've been looking at is something again that I'm sure you've come across in, in your daily work is, you know, there's a lot of repetitive stuff. If you're just going through setting up a job, you know, and you're just using the standard interface, there's a lot of things you do that are just kind of second nature to you. You don't even think about it. You just click through the first, you know, few steps of the setup because everything is pretty much like that. Uh, but for, for us, if you're familiar with Jenkins, of course, that's, that, that's not an issue. But again, if we want to make it easier for people in the organization to actually do the right thing and to pick up these things, those are, those are usually things that we don't need them to know about. We'd like them to concentrate on the things that are just specific to the type of job that they're trying to do. And that's really what we mean when we're talking about you know, a domain-specific language. We, really what we're saying is we want them as it's somebody, if somebody's creating a project, let's say you've, you've authorized them using the, the mechanisms that we've just talked about, you've authorized your developers in a particular group to create jobs to do specific things within the, the overall project, you know, an organization structure that you have and that you've defined. And we only want them to have to worry about the things that are, uh, that are actually relevant and germane to them and what they're doing. Right. So, I, I once went yeah. to this phone, phone company, mm -hmm. the cell phone company that's doing some stuff. And I mean, they have all these, all these acronyms that made no sense to me whatsoever, but they made total sense to these users. So for these people, this big box that they have to fill in to type in the shell script, is actually a lot worse than all these, you know, the acronyms with checkbox uh, so that they can exactly control what they do. They don't really exactly care how they're built. They only want the sort of UI to speak their language, so to speak. So, uh, yeah, yeah, this is not, an, a lot. Another good example I was thinking about is um, some of you may have seen, I've, I've been doing a few, a series of blogs lately with Case Help all around doing builds for mobile environments, you know, building you know, iOS or Android builds. And in many cases there, the bit you're specifically interested in is the bit about, for example, the device configuration for the emulator or the specifically mobile stuff. Actually setting it up to, you know, get the code from the repository and to, you know, do an Xcode build or to do an Android build, that's pretty much cookie cutter stuff. And if I'm setting up a whole series of these jobs, I just want to focus on the bits that are specific to what I'm trying to do. So what we've done is to build in this concept of templates through this plugin so that th there are a number of different types. I think the easiest one to sort of conceptualize is this idea of a job template. And again, it's you know, just the idea of you, know, you can hide away from users a lot of the, the details except for the ones that are specifically relevant to the job they're trying to do. That's the goal we want to get to. Kosuke, okay, right. back to you. Yeah, so, uh, I guess. Mm. As a demo guy, my job is to actually show that this whole stuff is work, that actually does work. I'm sure um, everyone believes you, but we'll <laughs> show it anyway. <laughs> so, um, the, so the idea of template is, let's say, so we'll start off with something, uh, something simple. So let's pretend that we are building the appliance, like you know, the home, home appliances, right? So as a build engineer, I'm sure you have some processes that you wanted to enforce. So let's say, um, so for us, we're gonna, well, actually, no, this, I'm not the wrong UI. So I'm going to create a new template by going to this new template UI. Um, and um, so like a CME Corp appliance build. And then so let's start with the builder template, which is the easier one. And then so here as a build engineer, so I'm doing this as a build engineer, right? Because I'm the guy who defined the the, how the rest of the company does the build. So the first question I have to ask myself is, well, what is it that my users need to fill in? So let's say, because this is an appliance build, the first thing we're gonna ask is, well, what's the name of this thing that's building it, right? And then here I, I think about, well, what is it that the user interface control that I wanna to present to the user? There's all kinds of different choices, but it's a name, so let's just uh, have a text field. And then, oh, uh, so this name needs to be in the uh, product code catalog um, of, of, I don't know, catalog of the company or something. 
So you're basically telling the user what this is supposed to be. And then next, as a build engineer, you decide how this translates. Well, I guess actually, let me add one more thing to make it a bit more interesting. Well, let's say um, the second flag we need for the build process is the, whether something needs export control. Um, because it, let's say if you need export control, you might have to do a few more things, like you know, verifying that the cryptographic stuff is within the, what the DOJ would allow you to do, things like that. So this one is checkbox. Um, then I guess I'll skip the inline help. And then, so now, we, so now that we know what the user has typed in, so we use this name, I'm sorry, these IDs to refer to them, actual values later, but now we define a build process. So there's a number of ways of defining it, but the one out of the box is a shell script with a Groovy templating in it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just, uh, let's say, building appliance. I don't have a real build script, but obviously this is where all your hard work would go, you know, calling this tool and that tools and whatnot. And uh, because it's got this uh, Groovy environment, I could sort of have this embedded Groovy script code. So um, I can have the, I can refer to the export control. And if the export control needs to be set, then I might do some additional uh, verifying um, encryption setting or something like that. And here. I think I got this right. So, um, so now that I defined a template, now I switch my hat to the regular user, and then I, when he's creating a new build, let's say someone is building an oven, right? So then when he chooses the freestyle project, in the main build section, they'll see this ACME Corp Appliance build as a first class citizen. And then in the UI, they see what I as a build engineer has defined. It's complete with all the help that I have typed in. So now I'm building a uh, oven, and let's say I need a export control. And then when you do the build, um, it actually builds what the I as a build engineer has defined um, like that. So um, this is the simplest form of template, but it's not the most powerful one. So to make this a bit more interesting, let's sort of, you know, in, in we are build is more uniform you can create, you can actually turn the entire job into a template. So for this, so this is the job. That, so we already manually created this freestyle job that we want to use as a basis, I mean, right? So this is basically the job definition that we want to take. So I'm gonna cut and paste this guy and then um, go back to the template UI and now I create a new job template. So um, Corp Appliance Build Appliance Project or whatever. And again, I, need, I already have a name because it's a job. Job always have a name in Jenkins. So I'm gonna just add the export control things again. Um, and then uh, get the same checkbox in here. Now this time when I define a template, I define the job in terms of its XML. So I just cut and pasted what I just copied from. And you know, there are a few places where I want to defer to the variable that we just created. Um, so the export control be, uh, would be this, and then that's it. So now, so now I created a whole new job template. So it, when, now I switch back to my regular user hat, and when I create a new project, like, like a washer, I can choose this corp, ACME Corp Appliance Build Project, and when I create OK, I only get, instead of this, full-blown multi-page freestyle project, you only get to see uh, if what you have configured. But as far as Jenkins is concerned, it's still the, the full-blown freestyle job. So the people can do the build, and then you, know, you, can, you can have the source code check out from whatever, or do the build the way you like it, and so on and so forth. So it will allow your users to sort of see a lot less complexity. And in this way, they can't do anything that you don't approve of, right? So it's substantially sort of constrained in what they can do. And the reason this is called template and not a wizard is because later if you as a build engineer decided to change the process, so let's say you know, the, your powers that be decided that now we need to run uh, find bugs um, to verify the code quality, you can just come in and update this template and everyone would automatically pick up the, this new setup so let's say I go back to washer and without updating the configuration, if I do another build, 
then this will now start running fine bugs. So you can imagine that this would be a tremendous saving if you have like a tens of or even hundreds of similar jobs that share the same build. So that's about it for the template. And back to the slides. Thanks very much. So here's the, the next one. I, uh, the, the title is, is my summary because I thought this is really what it's about. It, it's, it's making sure that everybody, everyone who's using the system within the organization is actually on the same page. And it's trying to avoid these kind of situations that come up. You've got two different teams. Obviously, you want, sorry, was there a question there? Um, well, then it updates the uh, it updates all the jobs. The, 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 you know, it get the change automatically gets reflected to all the jobs right away. Yeah. Uh, so the question was, I guess I should repeat the question. So the question was, is, this, uh, is the template plugin free? Uh, so the template plugin is not free, unfortunately. Or see, I, I gotta, I gotta, uh, I got to put the roof on my. Uh, head, I guess. Uh, yeah, so the folders is free, the backup to cloud is free. I, I think there are, might be one or two more, but uh, that's it, basically. Good. So perhaps we, we, can do a, we can do a quick recap at the end when we've shown you all the different plugins, and for, you know, to make it clear, we'll say which ones, which ones are part of the free pack and which ones are part of the subscription. So again, where you have situations where you have sort of multiple teams within the organization, you've, you've got different people, running as they should, running the, the, the continuous integration environment for their areas. But you know, we want to encourage people to download plugins that they need, to use new things, even to, you know, to write their own plugins, put them in to do specific jobs and so on. But you want to avoid these kind of situations where you know, usually just a week or so before a big deadline release, you suddenly find that somebody's got They've got their Jenkins configured slightly differently from you know, the, the other team, and therefore you have some kind of a mismatch. And the, the solution we're suggesting for this is the ability to have a custom update center. So obviously, you know, there is the, the kind of master community update center, but you might want to exercise some degree of sort of overall control over that so that you can say for everybody working within my organization, I'd like them to be updating please from this one set so that we all know that we're on the same page. And that's this concept of a, a custom update center. So the idea here is to make it easy for you to create your own update center so that you can host plugins, binaries, you can pull them from the, from the up the upstream update centers, but you can just say, okay, here are the canonical versions that I want everybody working with so that we all don't go nuts, you know, trying to worry about whether the base installations are, are in sync, if you like. Right. When everyone runs the same version in your org, it makes the support job easier. So that's, that's, I think that's one of the important benefits. Absolutely, yeah. And I think we have a, a short demo of this I one. Guess, yep. Sorry. sorry, it's you back again. <laughs> so, um, the, so this one, I don't, it's a bit tricky to show because it, you need multiple instances, but so I'll show you some, at least like uh, the UI and so on. So the update center is again, just like another item on the Jenkins. So custom update center, and then there's a dedicated type that you can pick from, okay? So when you create this guy, um, well, there are a few things you could choose. So roughly speaking, you can do two things. So the one, so the one use case that we thought of is like you want to basically filter through, I mean, the show through all the open source plugins in the community update center, but with some tweaks, like say you wanted to exclude certain version of CBS plugin because they don't work or something like that. Um, the other use case that we thought about is like you use this side by side with the open source update center just to distribute the plugins that you develop within your in-house. So let's say, let's try the latter. Um, what I can do is I can manually upload the plugin uh, from my local disk space. So let's say um, this is what I manually created, the plugin, and then if I upload this guy, it will show up in this update center, and then I can, if I have a multiple versions available, I could pick what version to expose and then the advertise to the rest of the instances. And um, if you look at this data file that it's producing, uh, you'll see that it's, it picks up the uh, 
the plugin that I just uploaded. So the other Jenkins instances that's running could either manually type in this URL as update center and then use AOC or the plugins. Or to make it even easier, we actually generate a plugin on the fly, the installer plugin, so to speak. So if you take this plugin and then you know, deploy it in other instances, they automatically picks up this update center as upstream. So you can very easily push your changes and then custom plugins to different organizations. So that's quickly uh, what this does. And back to Mark. Thanks very much. So um, one of the other things that we want to make it easier for you to do is to have this kind of, you know, don't even think about it approach to, to backups. And while I was looking at this, I was reminded that, I mean, just uh, at, at home, you know, I put in one of these Apple time capsules. In fact, I only bought this about a month ago, and it, 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 I've just so forgotten about it. I had to go online now to try and remember what it was called. But I stick it in the corner of the room. You know, this gets backed up. My kids' laptops get backed up. Even my wife's stuff gets backed up, which is kind of almost unheard of. And it's that kind of forget about it approach that we want to, to encourage here. Because if you have to kind of think about doing backups, you know, again, you, they don't happen, right? So making it really easy for it to happen. And, and this is where we can take advantage of the fact that as a cloud provider, this is sort of cloud bees, you know, with us with our, our other hat on, you know, as a cloud platform as a service provider, we have the ability to have these services that just run in the cloud, just like the time capsule runs in the corner of my living room. It can be there as a service, and you can have these backups just happen automatically. You don't have to think about it. All your configurations, your jobs, all the things that you, you have to rely on to be backed up so that you can recover if you have you know, some kind of catastrophic hardware failure or outage or something like that, so that that just happens automatically. And that's... That's really what this plugin is all about. It's sort of super simple. It's not something that you know, we really need to demo, but I think we all get the concept. Instead of you know, backups being something that's scheduled, you have to do it, or you know, there's some process that can go wrong that can break. This is just set up. It automatically backs up securely into the cloud. It happens on a regular cycle so that when you need you know that you're going to have something that's up to date and that you can restore and recover from. So I guess this brings us to you know, one of the biggest topics, which is the, the title of the talk here. And this is really to talk about how can you come back faster in the event of some kind of a, an issue. If you have a problem with the Jenkins Master or the system that the Jenkins Master is running on, how can you get up and running again faster, and how can you do it without you having to be the one to jump in and do that? And this whole uh, support for high availability with, within Jenkins is, I'm sure I can see Kosuke itching to jump in here and <laughs> right, right. tell you all about yeah. it. So let me put the slides and hand right. over. <laughs> so, right, so being a geek, naturally, I kind of get excited about it, not the gritty details of how this <laughs> works. But so, you know, the Jenkins does store everything in the file system. So, the way our HA works is you, know, you can have multiple master processes that's basically sitting on the same Jenkins phone. And then we coordinate through this file system to figure out how to talk to each other and so on. And then normally any, at any given point in time, one guy acts as a master and then the other nodes are standby. And then master node is carrying out all the bills. But for whatever reason, let's say like a memory filled up or, or the hardware goes down, the primary node goes down, the standby node is, is going to notice that and take over the primary role. So that's what's uh, shown on the right-hand side. Um, and the, 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 there is a box, well, okay. So normally people then use it with the, in conjunction with the reverse proxy so that the, your users should be always hitting the reverse proxy. And then that's capable of detecting what, which one of those backend nodes are active and direct the traffic. Um, and then you can also have a small monitoring tool that's like a, that box that says MT. Um, because sometimes when the fadeover happens, you want to run some, like a script as a root. You know, say, move, the switch the floating IP, change like a, the mirror status of the DRVD, any number of things. So this monitoring tool is a small program that you can run as a root because it doesn't really have any attack surface from outside. And then it, they'll get notification when the failover happens so that you can run some scripts that you configured. Um, so I just. I think there's a demo. Yeah, yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. 
should have started talking here. Mm -hmm. um, so the, to demo this, um, so so far today, all the instance, all the stuff that I was showing um, is actually running on the highly available, I mean, the, there are the two instance, oops, two instance here that I've been running. So this is actually primary, and then I started another node that's acting as a, as a standby. Um, so if I go to, so this is the node that we've been seeing, but if you go to see the other one, it's also sort of actively working, except it's being in a standby node. And we also provide this, if you go to the Manage Jenkins link, we also provide a plugin that shows you this HA status. So you can see that the two nodes are currently checked in and so on. So to simulate the failure, I'm gonna just kill the, the primary nodes. So let's say you know, this happened because the uh, process was uh, the memory had filled up. So the AD80 becomes unaccessible because the instance that was using was just killed. But if you go back to AD81, so that it, not, it already notices that um, the, the other guy had, had died. And then so it's in the process of taking over, I mean, starting the recovery. Um, and then, so now it came back up. So again, if you had a reverse proxy, your users didn't really notice any differences in what happened, except for, I don't know, 10 seconds or 15 seconds of the delay. And then this is gonna really work well with the lazy loading stuff that we're adding uh, in this week. Um, so yeah, so that's basically, I um, think that's basically it. So with that, um, back to slide again. So what happens to the job that was uh, So the question was, what happens to the build that was going on? Now, unfortunately, those are lost. Um, because there really is no way of keeping track of like exactly at what point the build was doing when the master died, and so that unfortunately is gone. Well, so the slave would actually notice that the master is dead, and then the slave would commit suicide along with all the builds that's going on. <laughs> yeah, they can't live without masters. I, ho I hope the killing slave is a politically correct term in the US. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so it depends on how you start the slave, but for example, in many launch mode, it's the master who starts the slave, right? So as soon as the backup came, fade over, immediately they start launching slaves. And in some other modes, it's the slave making connections, and they are designed to automatically reconnect to the master, so they would work. So this, the, this behavior of committing suicide is baked into the slaves, so it doesn't really matter how you're running it. Uh, so the question was like, what? So all the job configuration, yeah. So the, yeah, I guess I should have shown it to you um, because it, if you look at this now, act, so this new instance now acting as a primary, it's already got, it got all the jobs that we created today in this demo. So I mean that's like a whole point of it, and it's quite it, the way it works is because they share the same Jenkins home, so whatever written is already picked up. How do you distinguish between failure and restart? Well, restart is a failure, I guess. So, um, oh, you mean the Jenkins master restart? Yeah. Um, so, if you good question. So, if you if you restart the current primary, then yeah, that fade over would happen. Yeah. So that's actually a good weak point because that allows you to do kind of rolling updates. So that is, if you if you update, you can update one instance to a newer version while the other guy would take over and so on. So. Yeah. Oh, no, no, it won't give back by default. So it will stay, stay online until you kill it. Well, yeah. It yeah. Um, well, this is what we have today. Um, and I'm sure as with any features, I'm sure there is room for improvement. So stay tuned for more to come. But uh, that, what I think you know, things like what you said, that picking over the, the jobs that has died in the middle or things like that, that doesn't exist there. It's a pretty risky thing to do too. Like if you're running a release process, you don't want that to restart. So, um. uh, you mean like these are how jobs are shown, or am I missing your point? Oh, I see. Um, it depends on exactly when it died. So like if the build has been died when the, it's almost over, you can see the final status of it. But if it's in the early on, you might, it, might, it often shows up as aborted. Uh, 
Yeah, as you see, the, uh, the, so this is currently running on the standby now because I killed it. And then you, as you can see, it's, it's having all the jobs, including the ones that I created, right? The custom update center or, or the templates that I created today. So, you know, it, it is exactly designed to take over the exact same configuration when the primary died. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, maybe I should take the rest of the question yeah, after all. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. um, this looks like a, so we will we'll take the rest of the question after after the show because I did, I mean, Mark does have more slides that uh, that that we should we want to show. To show, let me show you quickly because we, we we're we're running close on time. But I just wanted to mention a couple of other features that we've been able to to build in and contribute. So there's the concept of a, a validated merge, and clearly, you know, the great thing about this is that you know instead of your pushing your code, if you like, into the main branch of, of, of the repository, having the test run, and then if there's a problem, you have to back it out. Obviously, you know, Jenkins can support that. It makes it possible and, and to a certain extent easy to do that, but it's much better if you can have this idea of, essentially, you can have a sort of shadow repository, you push the code into that, we run the build tests against that. If they pass, then those get pushed into the main repository so that if you like, no bad code ever gets to the main line of, of your source code repository. Right. That's, that's really the Yeah, the so idea this is there. basically the mm. same thing as I showed this mm. morning in mm. the keynote on BuildHive. It's the exact same workflow, but on your own instance. Yep. A couple of other things here, um, just to pick out one or two of them. The, um, to make things even faster, to enable you to sort of fine tune the operations, things like the, the fast archiver plugin uses an rsync style algorithm. In the example, if I have time to show you, for example, I have a mobile build, and part of that is to package up an iOS application into an IPA archive, which can then get pushed out via test flight or whatever to, to beta testers. The archiving process, I mean, if you look, that's a, that's a big file that we have to build. Most of those are kind of images and things, things that are not going to change. So we want to just do the archiving by looking at the deltas and just doing a smart archiving, if you like. Right. It can save an awful lot of time. Right, mm -hmm. yeah, so what it does is, you know, in the mm -hmm. CI build, normally, if, if you look at artifacts, right, so it's the artifacts that's big, that takes mm -hmm. time to transfer, right? And if you look at two artifacts of adjacent builds, they're mostly the same. There's only a small portion that changes. So what we do is look at those differences, but the master already has an artifact of the previous field, so if you can efficiently compute the delta between those two guys, you only manage to send a small portion. So this isn't like a ggif kind of compression, but it's a lot smarter. And then I, I, you know, I really like this. And there are a, a number of other features here. We probably don't have time to talk about them because we're running up against the, the, quarter, the three quarters. But again, there's details of all these uh, on the site and, and do have a look at the, the blog and the wiki and so on. So I just wanted to, to finish up by saying, well, you know, obviously we want to go from being good to being even better and even smarter and you know I always feel a little bit queasy about this slide but you know obviously when things go wrong when there are issues you know who it is that's standing on the track so one of the things that you can do to make things even better even smarter is actually to look at where you can take advantage of the cloud and there are a lot of things where you can actually offload a lot of these tasks that are a repetitive you know, they're not value add from your point of view. There are things that can go wrong. You can simply offload a lot of these to the cloud. Now, one of the things that we do at CloudBees with our platform as a service is to enable you to have Jenkins Masters, Jenkins as a service running in the cloud. It is Jenkins. You can upload plugins. You can do all the things. You work with a Jenkins console. It's not, you know. It's not some sort of stripped down version. You are working with Jenkins in just the normal way. And you can do that you know, through a subscription service. You can also just try this out. You can sign up for free with CloudBees. You can look at it. Uh, that's one of the examples I'll show you. This is all done on a free account. So you can, you can come in, have a look at it. You can try it out. You can see if this is going to help you in some way. We can provide code repositories, uh, you know, subversion repositories, Git repositories. You'll have a, a, a Maven repository automatically configured for you. It can be team-based as well so that you can have sharing of, of the resources in the cloud. And also you can take artifacts, you can take applications that you build. Uh, maybe you build these as part of your sort of testing 
process and you can actually deploy them into the cloud so that you can have these instances spun up temporarily so you can run integration tests and so on against them and then, then they drop down. You don't have to provision environments at all. We have a, a sort of variety of, of, of partners that provide services that are sort of automatically integrated into that ecosystem so that if you want to, uh, for example, bring up database services to use as part of your testing or your provisioning environments, you can do that. There are services from people like Source Labs, a Sonar, that again, you might want to build into your testing pipeline as well as the sort of runtime management services like from New Relic and Paper Trail for sort of log file consolidation and so on. I'm not going to swap over the machines because it just takes too long. Could you just pull up Partner Demo in the, um, in the browser? All right. And what I would have done is hook this up here. Uh, I have a set of projects. You might want this. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, it's fine. No, I can no. talk here and then I'll just do a push over there. So I set up a, a few projects just as an example. This one is open. You can, you can see this yourself. So just take a note. It's partnerdemo.ci.cloudbees.com. And this is the kind of, uh, you'll get a read-only view. It's the, the works, you know, the, it's the Jenkins workspace that I've been using for all my uh, mobile CI blogs that I've been working on recently with Kosuke. And uh, this is perhaps a nice example uh, of some of the ways in which that you can use the cloud. Here we have, for example, I have a project that builds a sort of a, an Android and also um, a, an iOS chess application. They're based on the standard Stockfish example. And then I actually have a back-end uh, server which kind of records the moves and s records games and so on. It's the, the beginnings of a sort of rud rudimentary social chess server, if you like. And then from this, I can set up build pipelines, and we have examples here where whenever I make a change to the front end or the back end, we're going to do those build jobs, and then we're going to run integration tests to make sure the interfaces haven't changed and the front ends and the back ends still talk to each other. But here's the one that I just wanted to call out to you. For example, um, if I know how to drive your computer, there we go. Here's just a simple example of using a multi-configuration project so when I'm building, I'm doing an Android build, this is all set up in the cloud and you can cite, these plugins are all you know, freely available so you can go in, create yourself an account, try this out yourself, copy this as an example. I can do a full Android build, I can spin up the simulator with appropriate device configurations and I can actually test that with the simulator. Now, here's a very small kind of matrix build. All I've done is sort of uh, set up a matrix across locale, screen density, and the system image. But of course, in real life, if you were actually building and testing an Android uh, release, you'd have possibly a matrix with hundreds of entries because of the variety of different devices that need to be supported. Now, the great thing about that is you can spin that up in the cloud. You sort of, this would be a great thing for the templates that Kosuke was talking about because the bit of this configuration that you're really interested in from a, a developer point of view is just the things that are specific to the actual emulator itself. So that those are, you know, let me come down here and, whoops, I'm having trouble driving your system here. There we go. Yeah, here we go. So I come down here. These are the bits that as a, a mobile developer and tester I'm interested in. I'm just interested in things like density, locale, target ABI and so on. All the rest of it is kind of Jenkins stuff that I don't really need to know or care about. So great thing is hide that away behind a template and then the users can do the sort of things they need to do. And then again, if we come down here, that's running the, that's setting up the emulator. Again, this is kind of standard Android stuff. We can hide all that away. People don't need to see it. They just need to see what's the Android version of the, the SDK they're working with and what are the, um, you know, what are the, the, the parameters for the device and so on. So that's just a, a, a really quick example of the kind of ways, just one of the ways in which the cloud can seriously help. Can you sorry. just grab us the... Uh, yeah, sorry. I think he's jabbing that I'm not using Mac. Yeah, no, 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 no I'm struggling here. Um, but, you know, again, just doing the integration is not enough. You know, that's a great example of 
I could make a change anywhere. I could make a change to one of the mobile clients. I could make a change to the back-end server. I could change the interface. All those things actually need to be tested, working together. And in that example, they actually are. And there's another project which I didn't, you know, it's not included there, but for example, we work with a partner like Sosta, where they actually will run sort of touch test aware tests so that they actually do the build and then they'll simulate, you know, people turning the device sideways, touching, clicking it, swiping things. All those things can happen just as soon as you check in any particular piece of code. So that's a great example of the kind of thing that, that you can do. So just to sort of wrap up, uh, as part of the, the, the Jenkins enterprise, do you just want to flag up which ones are sort of part yeah, of the free plugins so the, and which are part of the enterprise? Yeah, free plugins are, I think, the folder plugins and the backup. I think that's basically it. Yeah. yeah. And so here's, again, the last slide. This is what we'd like you to take away from here. Please do download those CloudBreeze free enterprise plugins. Check out Nick's uh, wiki post. That's where you get them from the, from the update center. And of course, if there are things around high availability and those features, try to find one of the guys with the blue shirts and we'd be very happy to help you. And also the Jenkins Enterprise itself is free for download to try for, I think, 60 days. So thank you very much. I'm sorry we ran over for a few minutes, but I hope you found it interesting.